Many of us in adulthood find ourselves stuck in a regressed or frozen place as a result of childhood trauma. And so in this video, I want to look at how we get stuck uh, and then talk a little bit about how to get out of stuck places. Um, so uh, the, the basic premise or paradigm that I'm working with is the paradigm of breath, of movement, that life is a rhythm, whether it's an atom, the breathing in, the breathing out, the intake of food, the releasing, uh, the movement through time. Uh, there's a constant process of taking in and letting go uh, of energy, and, and that's what life is. And when we get stuck, there's a traumatic event that appears bigger than the breath. So the normal cycle of, of, of that breathing in of the moment and moving on uh, to a new moment freezes. And uh, if we look at this from a couple of different angles, uh, the first thing we see is, is human motion human motion as we're going forward is very much replicating a circle. We're, we're leaning in and we're, we're doing it on two legs. Uh, but we're, we're moving forward in time. And it gets, it's pretty easy and natural. Any healthy person is moving through time emotionally, uh, physically, psychologically, sexually, developing new ideas, etc. And of course all the biological functions of taking in and releasing. Where it gets stuck is if there's an external force that leans hard on this left leg right as the right leg is, is trying to lean forward. And we, all, we either fall, uh, flatten our face because we can't uh, pick up the next leg and move forward or uh, we stop. We stop moving to maintain some sense of, of balance, uh, but with an inability to take that next step. And this typically comes from an external force. We can see it in a, uh, in a car wheel, or any wheel, that if all of the weight gets concentrated at, at one point, that if the weight gets bigger, then the momentum, if we have a small motor, etc., to, to propel the, the wheel forward. It either freezes down at this point, or it's just a very awkward uh, and energy inefficient wheel because the weight is not evenly distributed. Uh, and so there's a couple of different things that can go on here. When this is an external force, it's usually in a scapegoating type pattern or a shame uh, type pattern, for example, the black sheep in the family, where all of the shadow of multiple people get directed on one person. And so it's very difficult for, uh, you know, that person can perhaps deal with their own shadow, their own kind of stuck points, but when everyone else's gets projected on there as well, there's a freezing. And the, uh, the solution is either to uh, send the weight back where it came from uh, or to uh, spread it evenly around the wheel, as in when you take your tires into a, an auto mechanic to be rebalanced. They, they measure the weight they, and they put little weights around the wheel so that it will spin uh, uh, you know, efficiently. Forgiveness ties into this a little bit. Um, if you look at the word to give back to what was there before, to forgive, uh, you know, there's something suggesting, suggestive in the word about giving back the weights that don't belong to us. Uh, we also have in the word forgive, to give to the future, that when we forgive and uh, let go of the, the weight that was given to us, we're giving something to the future, to the, the ease and grace of the future journey. Um, and 
th there's a couple of ways where, where this can happen, where, uh, or a couple of sources for this concentrated weight, you know, at one moment in an individual's development. Um, and well, a another form that this we can take on this asymmetry is, for example, in a human interaction, um, where there's normally a healthy give and take in any relationship. But in an unhealthy relationship, uh, person A gives, and rather than person B receiving and giving back, uh, person B takes. So there's becomes you know a, a concentration. Maybe you give a in a very small sense, you give a compliment to someone. And you say, oh, it's lovely to see you. And you see something, you know, honorable and, and beautiful in the other. And the other responds by saying, yes, it is lovely to see me, and ignores as kind of acts as if you don't exist. So there's a giving of, of value, and then there's a taking of value. Now you've got an asymmetry. Um, and in a typical relationship, you might just say, aha, that person is in a narcissistic place, um, you know, is in survival or, or something of that nature. And you might say, well, you know, that's not a relationship that I'm going to make very significant. But in a child uh, relationship with a parent or a teacher, or when this happens to a group, um, when you have the, the phenomena of an individual saying, I'd really like to be part of your group. And the response is, well, perhaps you would, but we don't want you. It, it's a difficult uh, dynamic when, there's, when it's either with a group and an individual, that's often uh, referred to as shaming, where the group identifies some part in the individual that perhaps they don't want to own and embrace in themselves, that is not welcome in the group. Uh, and so, uh, the, the, you know, shame is a, is a social phenomena that basically says you're not welcome. Where you are, as you are, is not welcome. And um, when the individual responds by saying, well, perhaps this isn't as healthy a group as I thought, um, and so, you know, I'll take back some of the, I guess, projected value, because if you want to belong in a relationship or with a group, and there's a sense of admiration, you know, a, a, a sense of projecting the ideal self to, to another or a group, um, it's, it's a difficult thing to recover from because to the degree that you believe in something admirable in the group is to the same degree that their exclusion of you becomes something uh, that seems to reflect negatively on you. You know, like, gee, I, I, must, I must not be lovable, etc. And, and this is the the, the transference of the group's inability to love or integrate or receive or accept onto the individual, where the individual is asked to carry the inadequacy of the group. Uh, because truly so, in, in the abstract, uh, as we're you know, evolving conscious, consciousnesses, um, when you think of uh, you know, a higher deity, not necessarily the projection of, of the uh, chauvinistic male onto a deity, but when you think of a higher deity, uh, it is a more intelligent deity. By definition, if it is bigger, it is more inclusive. The bigger the deity, the bigger the, the consciousness, the more it includes. By definition, you don't get big by rejecting uh, most people or most of reality. You get big by developing your capacity to, con to include and synergize with more intelligence, intelligence being the efficiency with which energy is transformed into human well-being. Um, and it's similar in an ecological framework. When you have an intelligent culture, there is no garbage. There's only energy being turned into one shape, 
that's been then being utilized to become another shape and then being utilized to become another shape. And there is no, no place for garbage, you know, within uh, a very high level of intelligence. There is a place for garbage uh, in a very narrow-minded intelligence because garbage is simply whatever doesn't fit into the little box that is created. So we don't have any particular picture of you know how plastics can be transformed into something incredible for our ecology so we just dig, dig a hole and say you know get them out of my house um, but with an expanded view of of technology all energy has enormous potential and so at at some point and it's even beginning to dawn on on some of our companies um, you know, visionary companies are actually buying up landfills in the understanding that it's a great opportunity. There's so much energy stored in all those things that uh, the past generation didn't know what to do with. Um, and so this, this is, is uh, you know, how we get into this concentrated place. Now, the, uh, it's a little bit of a catch-22 in childhood trauma and abuse dynamics where the emotional self freezes at a young age. It gets stuck at a young age when uh, a trauma occurs. And so when, when the consciousness gets stuck at a small emotional age, then you have the problem of the, of the trauma repeating because a small age, like a two-year-old, if that's how you're relating to reality, the whole world is overwhelming to a two-year-old because they're so small. And when you get stuck in a small space, then you're in that constant disparity where the world is this giant place and we are this small consciousness. Now, um, one of the things that uh, you know, we, we see in uh, the process of violation where you have an older person or a church member or a therapist, someone that's held in esteem um, with kind of engaging with someone in who is either literally small or who is induced back into the unintegrated trauma in childhood in which we feel very small is you have a violation um, and it's a violation within the context of the role, the child parental role, the therapeutic client, the, the, therapeutic, the therapist, the, the teacher, the student, the government, the citizen. You have a violation of, uh, of ethics and ethics at their core are a path of action that allows everyone in the circle to meet their human needs and, and develop uh, as an individual uh, to become themselves. So Maslow has, you know, has uh, suggested that every human being in human history has had a need to survive, a need to feel secure in that survival, a need for love and belonging, which increases when you have highly uh, populated, uh, a highly populated species. So because, uh, you know, back in the days of may maybe cavemen or whatever, there's a lot of need for commerce with the natural environment. You're dealing with animals, you're dealing with caves, you're dealing with, uh, you know, large weather patterns. When you have a very cultured environment, uh, that is largely synthetic, meaning most of what you're interacting with are, uh, are items and beliefs and schools and institutions created by other people. The need for love and belonging is that much more important because it is your primary vehicle for ensuring uh, security and survival and survival. Um, you know, unethical action is an action that destroys the ability to survive, to feel secure, to have a sense of love and belonging. 
which includes trust and, and advocacy, which includes trust and trustworthiness, the whole framework of behavior that creates sustainable relationships, including uh, not lying, because lying is misdirection. Um, if someone says, I'll be there at you know, 2 p.m., but they're really sending you off as a decoy so that they can have sex with your wife or something like that, um, there, 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 there's a split between the language, uh, between the statements, and the actual behavior, which undermines the value of words, which are kind of our primary you know, means, means of interacting. Um, and so when there is a violation, and this pattern you know, typically starts in childhood, you have a violation. The, the father hits the child. The mother, uh, you know, the, the, the mother screams, you know, meaning there's an overload of emotional intensity. Um, and it's very important to be sensitive to the fact that to the child, the parents and the grown-ups are deities, are parents. They represent the paradigm of the world. And so if the parent isn't safe, the world isn't safe. Uh, the parent is the child's world. So when there's a, a, a violation, a shock, an overloading of the system, a lack of attunement, a lack of respect for the fact that this little one is so much smaller than this big one, um, it creates a reaction in the child. So there's violation, physical violation, emotional violation, uh, mental violation, there's a violation. The, the child will have a reaction, a defense, to say, no, this isn't good for me. Stop hitting me. Don't shout at me. You know, why are you always the one that gets to be right and all of that? Um, but when you have an unhealthy, perhaps a regressed grown-up who feels like a child, you often have this situation in our culture where no one feels like an adult. The adult feels at their wit's end because they've received no parenting uh, training. Uh, they've received no emotional literacy training. They've received no psychological training. They've received no training in trauma. So they, as the, the grown-up in this giant kind of body that represents the deity and world of the child, they, they, they feel completely... Uh, overwhelmed. The parent feels overwhelmed by the child, by the culture, by their own parents. Um, and when you have this discrepancy in mass, a giant body with all the legal authority and financial authority and uh, the ability to literally kill the child, um, uh, then when, when the child pushes back, uh, the, the, the grown-up child becomes more violent, has a tantrum, basically, uh, because they feel insecure and defied by their child. They don't know what they're doing, and so they're violating themselves, the relationship, and they're violating their child. The child pushes back. This frightens the parent because... They don't know what else to do. They're in an overwhelmed, regressed state. So you've got two children. So the grown-up communicates their incompetency, their inability to, to hold space for, for the interaction, uh, by escalating the violation, by escalating the violence. So you might have uh, a parent, for example, saying, you know, why are you such a mediocre you know, idiot, you know, why did you do this? And, and you know, shaming and, and berating the child maybe about a, a, a school project or maybe their child, which is, who is smaller than the school bully or whatever, is, uh, is being bullied at school. And the parent doesn't know how to deal with the bully at school because they never learned that at school either. You know, in a culture of bullying, nobody learns how to transcend bullying. Um, and so the parent feels inadequate, like, I don't know what to do here. And so they, they pass on the inadequacy to their child in the same way that it was given to them. Well, be bigger, be tough, fight the bully. 
I don't know what to deal with it. You deal with it. You know, you the child. Um, no, naturally, this is, you know, what a child desperately needs is a is an, an adult, not just a giant, but actually a mature person who knows how things works and will help them. When the the parent proves inadequate, and instead dumps the the problem on the child, you you know the parent told you to go to school, and then the teachers abandoned you to bullies and then you get hurt and you tell the, the teachers aren't particularly interested and you tell the the grown-up your parent and they blame you for the inadequacy of the school system and the inadequacy of the parental system of the bully because in a healthy culture you you bullying is not an epidemic it's a dysfunctional culture that raises bullies uh, the, the bully has always been abused. It's not, it's not, it's not healthy. Um, so the, the child tries to give the energy back to the parent and basically say, no, this isn't fair. You deal with it. Why don't you deal with it? You're telling me to deal with it. I don't know how to deal with it. If it's so easy, why don't you deal with it? The parent doesn't want to deal with it nor do they want to own to the child their inadequacy. They don't want to say, I'm sorry, kid. I'm scared. Um, I'm barely holding on to this job. Um, I, I'm jostled around in this way and that way. I really, uh, I'm, I'm feeling frustrated about the bullying that's going on in my workplace and I'm seething about that. And I'm blaming myself and calling myself a coward. So I'm just going to call you a coward that you can't deal with school bullying. Um, and so the, the, the parents do not generally want to dethrone themselves. In, in part, if, if they're feeling powerless and small, this is their one area of power uh, because their child hasn't yet you know, graduated to a point where they're independent. Um, and so... You know, if the child tries to wrestle away from being hit, then there's an escalation of abuse when you've got, a, a, you know, another child. Don't you fight me. I will hit you some more. If the child tries to run away, there's the chasing and the beating of the child. And so we have the violation in an unequal relationship. We have the healthy defense. Then we have the escalation through the bullying protocol of, of an incompetent parent that rages at the child. And this is an incredibly traumatic energy to receive by the child because in it is a number of things. Um, there's desperation on the part of the deity. I mean, you, you don't have healthy, mature grown-ups, i.e. adults, uh, taking out their pent-up frustration on their children. But we do have a lot of grown-ups in our culture taking out their, their frustration on their children. And so, um, and the adult in part, or the grown-up in part, hates the child for showing up their incompetency. And so there can be a mingle of hatred and rage and how dare you. Um, and it's irrational often. And the child realizes they're dealing with a crazy child, one, who can't admit they're a child, two, and three, who could kill him. And this is absolutely devastating for the child. The violation comes back double strength. And what the child is learning is that because I'm in an unequal relationship, if I protect myself, if I have integrity with my own boundaries, if I speak the truth, if I do anything healthy, I will be hurt more and I could die. It's, you know, and in the psyche of a child that needs love and belonging from their parents and from the the masculine and feminine deity, be it the parents, God, goddess, uh, the church, the teachers, they need 
love and acceptance to know what? To know that they are secure in their survival. Meaning when you get your clothes, when you get your food, when you get your money, when you get your transportation from a giant or a couple of different giants you know, that are moving around you that, are, that have the legal authority and are shaping things, you need their love and belonging for you to have any sense of security and survival. They could kill you in 24 hours if they wanted to. You know, and you know, if you're, you're, if you're five years old, you grasp that when, with the force of the physical impact. And what happens in this moment is the child understands that they do not have a protector and a provider and they internalize this. I'm not valuable enough to be protected uh, and loved. My boundaries are not as important as my parents. My life is not as important as my parents. My feelings are certainly not as important as my parents' feelings and my teachers' feelings and my government's feelings. They're looking out for themselves. Um, in order to survive and feel secure in my survival and have some sense of love and belonging, I have to switch from being cared for and growing up and, and being safe to taking care emotionally, psychologically, and sometimes physically and sexually of the giant. Because I don't have value. They have value. You see, this is the, the, the process where the, you know, you know in, in, at a very deep, innocent level of the child, the child comes into the world in infancy and says, I accept you. I love you. I'm here in your care. What do you need me to be, say, and do so that you will be happy, so that you'll love and accept me? And in a healthy uh, framework, uh, in a mature culture that's healthy, the message is, you don't need to take care of me. We're the God. We're the goddess. You don't have to take care of God. And you can see how this gets projected in the, the regressed child of the Old Testament. For example, here's a petulant old man who doesn't communicate. You think of the alcoholic. You think of the regressed, silent uh, American male who doesn't communicate. You have to guess what I mean by this situation. You have to guess, but if you do it wrong, you are thrown into a lake of fire and you're helpless. You see, this is the child's projection of the abusive father onto uh, a godhead that, that basically understands that God is so insecure that he'd punish you for eternity, for not guessing right, or not doing these dictates that don't necessarily correlate with how I'm feeling or how I want to live my life. What if I want to have a pig on a Friday or whatever? And, and you know, is I'll just learn at the end of my life whether I'll be thrown, thrown to, to, you know, misery for eternity. And so we, we see the the, the, the experience of the dysfunctional parent projected onto the deity, but when the child is young, they are the deity. Um, and, you know, in, in shame-based religious families, the higher deity and all eternity is used as a protection and justification. Um, and it's, it's very interesting that, um, you know, parents don't usually burn their children alive for and if they do it's usually cigarette butts in the feet or something you know as drunken games or something but it's not for all eternity but when you have a, a mom a dad that sticks cigarette butts in their child's feet and what listen, and enjoys the screaming and 
the child understands that they are in the care of a maniac for what seems like an eternity to the child. Because, I mean, when you're in trauma, you enter a timeless space. So it is an eternity. So you are being burned alive for, you know, for an eternity as a child. But then there's the, 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 the then you read the Old Testament or something, and, and this can be, you know, something that, you know, vindictive ministers or parents like to then read to their, their children. I always read the Old Testament. And, you know, God was just a bigger version of the terrifying father. Um, and there were all these rules, and they didn't get explained carefully. But if you made a mistake, you were hit, you were shamed, you were unwanted. Um, and so the child in this decision goes from the healthy self-defense mode of saying, cut that out, I don't like that, don't stick that food in my mouth, I, I don't like this, to allowing it, to enabling the abuse, to make the abuser feel better. You know, so if you molest me whenever you want to and I don't say anything, that makes you feel better? Okay, I will allow that. Um, you don't, you know, you don't want to deal with the fact that you're a hypocrite? I will allow that too, because I don't want to be hit. But what's being transferred is um, the beliefs and messages of uh, of the grown-up onto the child. Uh, so the beliefs and the messages come in the action because all actions, the conscious mind gives them some sense of meaning. And it's very difficult. Like if, I, if I'm in relationship with you and I hit you and you try and defend yourself either by stepping back or moving towards me and punching me in the nose. But first of all, your punch has a third of the impact of my punch. So there's, a, there's an innate discrepancy in power. But then I hit you again. There's a message in that. It's not just the, the physical cut. The message is you're not someone worth respecting. You're not someone that I care enough about to respect the integrity of your physical body. I'm hitting you with a message and a belief, what, that you're worthless, that you're inadequate, that you're unlovable. There's something in there, and every child hears it in a certain way. Um, but when you now have both parties in the abuse dynamic participating in the relationship, I get abused and I allow it. Why? Not because I'm valuable and I'm lovable and I'm a great person. That, do that doesn't fit. It's because I'm worthless. It's because I'm unlovable. It's because uh, I deserve it. So now you have sanity because sanity is, is, is the integration of behavior and beliefs and, and meanings. Um, because if you say, I'm lovable, but nobody loves me, how am I lovable? I mean, it just seems, it doesn't, it seems crazy. When the child decides that they are unlovable, they're bad, they're unworthy, they're never going to, no one cares about them. When the child decides those beliefs, they integrate with the messages of the behavior they're experiencing. Um, and children in particularly volatile uh, situations are looking for certainty. They need baselines in order to develop and attune to. And so, you know, in many situations, per perhaps with an addictive parent, uh, the parent might, s might say, you're great and you're wonderful, and then punch you up the next day when they're drunk. And so the child feels great, I'm lovable, and then it gets crashed down. And they can't defend, they can't protect against the drunk. So they decide, I'm unlovable. Now once they decide they're unlovable, they've got a stable thing. Because 
when, when the parent is nice to them, and sometimes the parent is pleading with the child in order to say basically, um, please don't remind me what a jerk I was last night. Please don't make me feel, you know, like, you know, a shame-based, incestuous child abuser. So could you please pretend it didn't happen? Just, it, it never happened. Uh, when you have that dynamic, um, then you, you, it actually strengthens the abuse of worthlessness because um, it's too frightening and crazy making to say I'm lovable at 6 p.m. but I'm unlovable at 2 a.m. and then I'm lovable at 10 a.m. and then I'm unlovable from 5 to 10 p.m. the next day. Which is it? It's, it's crazy making. There's a schizophrenic grown-up dealing with the schizophrenic integration of their psyche in a schi schizophrenic culture that does not teach integration and, and emotional literacy. And so the, the child, there's too much shock involved and there's too much helplessness. Because of course the child desperately needs to feel lovable and valuable. And then at the whim of an abuser, it's just snuffed out. They desperately hope for that and it's snuffed out and they feel powerlessness. And they're angry at themselves. Why can't I defend myself? And this is strengthened by the chauvinism in the cult that says, be a man, you know, be, be, you're your own person, you know, do you, if you were worth anything, you'd stand up to your old man or whatever like that, you know, that kind of message. And that's in the movies and it's in the media and perhaps your own parent is saying that. When you get bullied at school, Perhaps your abusive parent is saying it's because you're too weak. There's nothing wrong with the bully. Healthy cultures have tons of sadistic, uh, you know, uh, assholes that pick on little people. Nothing wrong with that. But if you couldn't defend, there's something wrong with you. Well, when the parent, you know, they might say, no, it's not fair. He's bigger than me. And the parent shouts and says, don't you say that. I don't want to hear that. You... You know, you fuck up of a child, and it gets worse, basically. So then the child accepts, okay, something wrong with me that I can't defend myself. Um, then the parent abuses you, and you've already adopted the parent's dysfunctional belief that there's something wrong with the victim rather than the perpetrator. Um, so now you're dealing with the shame and humiliation and helplessness of not being cared for, the trauma of not feeling safe, and then the shame that it was your fault, where the, the inadequacy of the culture is dumped on the child. Now the child will hold tight to something certain. I am unlovable, I'm unwanted, I'm not safe, and anything else is a pretense. So my parents are being nice, of course, because they want to feel good, and so I need to lie and pretend that their abuse is fine because their need to feel good is more important than my truth. And I can validate that by every time I say, well, I'm not good, why did you do that last night? And they hit me again and say, don't you sass your parents. Okay, so I'm completely worthless. When my parents are upset, they can abuse me. And when they want to feel good about abusing me, uh, they can pretend everything's wonderful, maybe buy me an ice cream cone or something like that and say, you know, don't, uh, you know, I'm a good parent, don't worry about it. I do, th I do this because I love you. You know, now you've got real insanity. Um, but the child is, is developed, their, 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 their certainty, their baseline, that uh, they are unlovable. Well, there's this chicken and egg dynamic with beliefs and with messages. Uh, and the, the psyche is always seeking integrity. It's seeking integration because, much like a rope, you are stronger when you are integrated. You take a tiny little nylon thread and you can break it. And another one, you can break it. You can break it a thousand times. But if you weave a thousand of those nylon threads into integrity, into a braided rope form, now... You can pull on it a thousand times and you will not break one of them because you've got an integrated psyche. 
And because it is the fundamental nature of the psyche to be strong, to be integrated, now unable to push through the barrier of abuse and integrate to, you know, because as a, as a, a child you're unable to integrate to the idea that you are valuable, you're not able to create the reality that reflects that as an infant with people burning your feet, terrorizing you, lying to you, humiliating you, bullying you, ignoring your feelings, the whole, the whole nine yards. You can't say that that's loving. It doesn't feel good. It's not loving. So you can't integrate around the beliefs you want to hold. You can only integrate into the beliefs of an abuse culture. In that framework, the, the, the child starts to create a reality consistent with the abusive beliefs to become stronger. The world is, is a shithole of a place. Uh, I'm a useless person. People suck. Uh, I'm never going to be loved in my whole life. These are beliefs. Well, as the child starts to gain strength and integrity in these uh, abuse beliefs passed on by the giant that they learn to. And, and we can see this in, uh, you know, in an abusive dynamic with, for example, a, a, a human being and an elephant. Um, you know, when, when, when a small baby elephant is captured and removed from their mother uh, so that they can be turned into an entertainment elephant or something like that, they will tie a rope around the baby elephant that is just big enough that the, the baby elephant can't break the rope. Now, if they use that same rope on a giant elephant that has grown up, the giant elephant never kicks the way the baby. See, the baby kicked as much as they were worth and they couldn't break the rope and it just cut into their skin. And that was the message. If you try and be a free elephant, your leg is going to get red and pink and get infected and all that. And it's your fault, right? Blame, you know, blame the victim. Once that has been internalized into the baby elephant, they will never try and break the rope uh, for the rest of their life. So that little rope, which a giant elephant could knock out and walk away at any time, has been brainwashed into a permanent prison. Um, it, they are now imprisoned by the beliefs formed by the initial experiences that they have integrated and internalized to become strong. It's pointless to fight the parents. Just go along with it. Don't rock the boat. It's pointless to protect, you know, project, you know, protest uh, a big power structure. They've got more money than you. They've got this. So whatever. And so you have the apathy uh, around the, the the cultural phenomena of gross negligence, abuse of power, uh, you know, all kinds of violations of ethics in the larger culture. And the question stops being what's right or what, does I what do I want? The question becomes a more cynical one of what will work here? And there's an analysis, okay, so-and-so raped you and did this. They've got the best lawyers in the country. You're not gonna prove it. But this other person you know, you, you don't. You could barely show up in court because you're dealing with all the trauma from the rape and, and stuff like that. So you're semi-coherent. You're not able to hold down a job. You're drinking to numb the pain. And this culture is going to blame you for these symptoms. You can't win. You can't win against the abusive parent. You can't uh, win against, you know, the terror of a traumatic father god, and you can't win against your government, you can't win against this. The whole thing is pointless. As you build a life around that pointlessness, it is not a life of hope and enthusiasm and investing in the future. Because that's inconsistent with the belief that week, and it's confusing. What do you mean the, the future is going to be bright? What well, never was before, what I wanted never, never mattered before. So how, why would it matter now? And like the elephant uh, that could break the rope, there is a biological wall of fire 
around healthy self-defense. Now, when I say a biological wall of, of fire, what I mean is, is that when the child fears death repeatedly and enters a traumatic state and enters the reptilian brainstem of fight, flight, and freeze, the sociopathic adaptive personality of the reptilian brain, which is designed to keep children alive in a sociopathic uh, environment and humans, it's the, it's the stem, it's the 200 million year old crocodile brain. When you've got that engaged, you lose all sense of compassion for self, all sense of compassion for anyone else. You become completely uh, and utterly uh, survival oriented. And this is where you get the brilliance of the sociopath. Because the brilliance of the sociopath comes with the complete cessation of feeling because it's too painful. No one gets induced into the reptilian brainstem around a loving, empathic, beautiful environment. And we're confused around that because we've defined uh, love in a very milk and honey type of, of superficial way. You know, where your doctor loves you and takes you away from your mother when you needed to biologically attune and prides you with here and cuts off your tip of your penis and has you listening to beeping noises. You know, Ted Kaczynski, um, his, his, mo his mother said that they, the hospital refused to let them be close to their child for like six days. And from the time that Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, came back in, uh, to the, in that six day period, his complete personality changed. In other words, the amount of trauma that Ted experienced in the six days as a young infant separated from his mother was such, was such, that he shut down the feelings that were too traumatic and terrifying and entered the reptilian brainstem, which is how do I survive in a sociopathic cult where everyone is in collusion and no one understands what I need, no one understands my terror, no one will alleviate the terror. And so you have, you have this, 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 uh, this, this tremendous experience of sustained violation and abuse, or maybe if you resist, they inject uh, anesthetics and they wipe you out, and every time you come and try and fight, they then put on a restraining order. It's, it's increasing the abuse by orders of magnitude with zero competency for the understanding of the child's psyche. When the child is violated, because there is a link between love and competency, and the link is the following. If you love someone deeply, you care about them. If you care about someone, you take time to learn about them. If you take time to learn about them, you start to understand them. Because the whole system of the psyche and the body is broadcasting constantly. Pain, not pain. This, not this. The, the, the whole structure is designed to give feedback. So it takes an incredible amount of brainwashed ignorance to completely ignore that. The baby is wriggling around, let's, let's put a straitjacket on them so that we can do this surgical operation or whatever it is. Uh, you know, and they'll never know anything, you know, it won't have any impact. Well, Ted Kaczynski never regained emotional bond and felt safe because his parents had given him and they didn't return. And they put the authority of the hospital ahead of the empathy of his desperation to a point of pain where he was never going to trust human beings on an emotional level again. Uh, this is an incredible wound. But we say, well, they were so loving, they brought him to the hospital. It's, it's see, and, and after understanding comes empathy. And with empathy comes attunement. And with attunement comes success. And more attunement, which leads to competency. And competency leads to attunement, 
and success and care, which creates gratitude and joy and ease, which synergize to become love. So there is a full cycle from love through to competency. And when you try and shove the word love onto anyone without understanding the cycle of competency, it becomes another form of abuse. Because you do not love someone unless you are competent to interact with them in a way that brings the greater ease and the success that leads to the attunement, etc. Um, and so uh, you've just made it worse by defining the deity, meaning everyone says love is all there is, blah, 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 blah. The child who has had incompetent sociopathic love administered uh, repeatedly just says, the whole world is about tormenting and terrorizing me. I want nothing to do with love. Love is dangerous because it's been rewired. Um, and so, uh, you know, in this dynamic, the integrity of the beliefs that I'm not safe, that the world is a sociopathic place, that love is a terrifying thing, get, stay away from it, then begins to, you know, lead to a reality that is consistent with that, that is consistent. People, if you're weak, people will abuse you. So I'm never going to be weak, so I'm never going to be vulnerable, so I'm never going to open up, so then no one can see me, and then the abuse continues. If I'm worthless as a human being, I'm not going to go to college. Why would a worthless person study for the future? They're worthless. Well, then when you have a cult that judges people based on their uh, financial success, and that looks at pieces of paper often more than they look at the actual competency, meaning you'll have people assign salaries because you went to Harvard and got a, an A. Even if you're, getting, if, if you're getting failed results and you've done the culturally sanctioned thing, they'll say, well, uh, there's nothing wrong with you. you. You went to Harvard and did this and stuff. We're, we're, we're not going to fire you, you know. Whereas you have someone else who might do the job incredibly well. Um, but it's like you're, you're showing up the way we think in our culture of someone who, who doesn't have any worth. You didn't go to college. You're not, you know, if you're unimportant, why would you dress importantly? It's inconsistent. So the child moves towards strength and integrity with the abuse dynamics which then they look at themselves and say, yeah, I guess I'm not worthless because no one, including myself, is treating me as someone who's worthwhile. Um, there's also the phenomena of, um, you know, the fact that um, once the abuse comes in and, 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 and takes hold, and it's a virus. I'm worthless, I'm valueless, I'm not safe, I'm unlovable. Okay? Those, those are the messages that have been received. They've been stabilized. There's a sense of helplessness when you try and fight that with someone who has the virus. In this case, various forms of abuse. You feel helpless, but you're, you're outgunned. You're, you're kind of at an angle. And, and pain plus helplessness equals trauma. Pain plus helplessness equals trauma. And trauma is a very difficult thing to deal with. You need help to deal with trauma. But in a trauma illiterate culture, you don't get the help. And so the question is, well, what are you going to do about the trauma? Well, one of the things that children do and abuse survivors do to get out of trauma is they try and heal the helplessness. So they're in pain and they're helpless and they can't stop the pain and they feel helpless. So what they do is they heal the helplessness by self-inflicting pain, cutting, banging, blame, shame, hating themselves. They inflict emotional, psychological and physical and sometimes sexual pain on themselves in order to rewrite the helplessness, 
to rather than saying, I'm a good person and I'm helpless to defend myself, they now say I'm a bad person and I'm not helpless because I hurt myself. And so there's a sense of, of power in the ability to control. We're going from uncontrollable pain that doesn't get support to pain that I'm in control of that makes me feel powerful. So we're me medicating the helplessness with more pain. But it is in doing so, it is also strengthening the belief in worthlessness because uh, how can how can one be worthy if not only is our abuser hurting us and not only is no one coming to our defense and not only are we hated for being a reminder of the dysfunction of the cult and of the dysfunction of the family, but we are now hating ourselves and abusing ourselves. That completes the narrative that I am a completely worthless person, which we then start to be behave consistent with that belief, which then strengthens the, the you know, people who target uh, victims, say they can tell from the way someone walks and the way someone, whether they will accept abuse. You know, a predator, if you talk with a sociopathic predator in, you know, in some of the studies, they will say, I know within about three seconds if that person is going to be easy to victimize or not. And I pick the people who are easy to victimize. The person with a slump who's depressed, who has no sense, who knows that they're worthless, is not going to fight an abuser. They're going to say, sure, I'm worthless. Um, well, th that's consistent with my belief. And they have more integrity after that experience because that's what they believed, that's how they were behaving, and that's how other people were behaving them uh, towards them. And one of the most difficult things when you have someone who has been systematically bound up in the cultural protocol of shame and abuse, one of the most difficult things uh, to do with someone like that is to get them to receive genuine love and help because it weakens their integrity. They've had messages that they're worthless and experiences that are worthless and they all fit nicely together in a package of sanity that says I am worthless. Now if you try and treat someone who is convinced that they're worthless, that they're worth something, it scares them because it weakens them. Now their beliefs are not, or their experiences are diverging from their beliefs. They believe they're worthless and they're sure that you'll know it and they may even think that it's a scam, right? Because we all know I'm worthless. And so the fact that you're showing interest in me means that you have another agenda because I'm not worth anything. What is it? You want to have sex with my body? You want to steal my money? What is it? I, it can't possibly me that be that there's any value in me. Now, um, the, the other kind of crisis for the person who's, who's dealing with uh, being abused um, in this framework, uh, and, and then there, someone's treating them well. The other crisis is the, the, the experience is now saying in this one little pocket of my life, in this one period of my life, someone is treating me as if I was valuable. I Meaning this, they're treating me the way a valuable person would be treating me, but I'm not valuable. But they keep treating me that way, and there's an uncertainty Maybe I am valuable, but it's, a, it's doubtful. No one else has seen that. I've never been treated that way before, may, but maybe it's true. Now you're weakening the person as they define their identity. Their identity is weakening. They are going insane as everyone goes through a certain amount of discordance as they make a transition from one set of beliefs to another set of beliefs, one set of experiences to another set of... There is a period of, you know, you could call it the narrows, the, the, the chasm, you know, this, this, this point where it's, it's very, very volatile because there's chaos and there's no clear picture. Now, if you believe that the world is a terrifying place and will get you if you're weak and you are experiencing the weakening of your abuse identity, you are going to be absolutely terrified. 
And who are you going to, in the fight, flight, freeze dynamic, who are you going to attack? You're going to attack the person who is weakening you. In other words, you're, they're taking your sane identity in which only bad things happen to you and you are a bad person and you deserve it and that's the way it'll be for all time. And they're taking you into, sometimes I'm treated well and I might just have some value. But I'm not sure why. If I have value, I haven't changed. So if I have value, why didn't I have value when I was six years old and even more innocent? That doesn't make sense. Is the whole world fucked up and I had value and they were all just complete morons? That's, that's a big response. That's terrifying to think about, particularly for a regressed child. I don't want to think that. I want to think that there was, they knew I was bad and I was bad because now I've got certainty. Um, and so often what will happen is the abuse survivor will attack the person who's treating them well. And there's a good reason for this. Be, you know, they're, they're experiencing weakening. The other thing that happens, by the way, when someone who has felt worthless for 30 years, 40 years, etc., and created, you know, like that elephant going from the, the imposition of trauma as a child to, to a grown-up hood in which they found out, they sought out people that would abuse them and reinforce the abuse, because it felt comfortable, it felt familiar. I feel strong in my abuse identity. The other thing that, that, that happens is if someone starts to discover their true value, uh, wow, that I'm as valuable as any other person who's ever lived. And the fact that I've been treated like shit does not have anything to do with my value. It has to do with the culture, the parenting, the, I'm okay. There's a tremendous sorrow. There's a tremendous grief for the lost 30 years. So you have an isolated person because in our culture we generally segregate people. You know, we 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 say that's a homeless person, they're comfortable being homeless, we don't talk with homeless people. You know, that's a this person, we they're poor, we we don't really deal with losers. Um, and so we segregate people. But when one person breaks the cult taboo to actually care for a minority who has been systematically shamed, um, you know, someone is actually nice to a black person in a slavery environment where everyone else is, is a bastard. There's, there's the sense of you're one person but I can't attune to one person when 99 people are going to treat me like shit. It's confusing. I'll get disoriented. That's the first problem. The second problem is the wave of grief in a cult that is emotionally illiterate and thus grief illiterate. We don't teach people the cycles of grief and the honor of going through the grief process. But when we start treating an abuse survivor well, and a mountain of grief blossoms as a healthy expression of, of the love, but in a culture that shames many of the feelings associated with grief and labels the grief itself as uh, feminine and thus inferior, particularly if you're a male. Uh, emotions are feminine, you're having an, a fountain of grief, you are now looked down on, and you're also hated by your fellow abusers or your fellow victims, because your fellow victims have maintained their sanity and their strength, their integrity, meaning reality is matching their beliefs and beliefs are matching their reality and it fits, and they've got certainty around that. So they've got a, a good predictable map of reality that is repeating itself, so they feel safe in the familiarity. If one victim in an abuse dynamic, like one black person in a slavery environment, one woman in a highly chauvinistic culture, one child in an abusive culture. The other victims get angry at the one who is destroying the certainty. You're ruining my certainty. The way I get through life is life's a shit and then you die and we all know that and we all live that and, and that's that's the way it is, that's the way it has been, it's always going to be that way, 
And so just deal with it. Be a stoic. Stoicism is, you know, a great response for that kind of universal unfairness, and stoicism can help someone survive. A stoic, uh, or the beliefs and paradigms of a stoic, is a very good paradigm for someone who is in a repeatedly un traumatic, uh, you know, dysfunctional culture, um, because they expect it, they have equanimity around it, that's just the way the world is, and I can make it through that because I made it through the last beating, I made it through the last rape, and so that's just life, this and that, and that's the way it is. The, 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 the someone who's breaking out of that cult, the abuse identity, is now damaging that stoicism, that certainty, and it's creating insecurity, because when you're uncertain, particularly when you believe the world is, in, is a scary place, you now have, uh, you don't want it to be uncertain, but progress, meaning more love in your life for someone around you or whatever, is ruining that. It's, it's, ru it's ruining it. And th this is not just the case in, in abuse by, by whatever. If you're a poor person and you've believed that rich people are jerks your entire life, and one of the people who, you know, was all there, rich people are jerks, they're jerks, they're horrible, they ruin the whole planet, they take advantage of everyone, and one of your group, who's, you know, part of the angry poor, starts to become rich. But they're a decent person, they're not a jerk. Now you're angry at them because the, the way that that pain was managed was by the certainty and the stoicism, etc., of, you know, all, all people are like this. But now I'm dealing with a complexity where I have to decide with each rich person, you know, is, are they good, are they nice, are they not? And then why am I poor? And why is this if some rich people are nice? And if some people can make the transition, could I? Am I a bad person? Is, is the only reason I'm not rich because I'm a loser? The way that all the, is that the reason? Well, you know, so there's all this uncertainty. So there's grief. There's dissonance. There's confusion with a general paradigm that the world is not safe to be confused in. Then there's the belief that it can't happen. People can't be that nice. Um, and... And the, the, and the, the abuse survivor with an abuse identity will often lash out at the, the entrance or at, the, the, at, 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 at a possibility. Now, the possibility offers some progress in objective terms. Do, do you want to be abused or not abused? I mean, in objective terms, you'd say, okay, well, even if one person is being nice to you or loving you or valuing you and no one else did, well, that's progress. But it's not progress if it destroys the certainty and if it's not sustainable. I don't know why. Why, is, why are you treating me well when no one else in my whole life has treated me well? It, it's not you. You haven't met other kind people. That's the only reason. It's just you were born here. The kind person was here. You hadn't met me. I've been kind to everyone. I've been kind to everyone and I just happened to have met you. And these other people were abusive to everyone and you spent a lot of time in their presence. That's it. You didn't do anything wrong. There was nothing you could have done as a five-year-old that would have made an, you know, an abusive parent suddenly not stick cigarettes on you or molest you or whatever. Nothing. You, you, you couldn't have done anything there at five years old, at six years old, at ten years old. None of it was your fault. And it's like, well, if it's pure random chance, I don't want to be this alienated and confused and get my hopes up and then the next person treats me like shit. Meanwhile, all my victim survivors are angry at me because I'm upsetting their apple cart, their certainty. And so I've got grief that I don't know how to deal with. I've got reality happening that makes me feel crazy. 
all my cronies, uh, who we all know the certainty about how sick the world is, they're all angry and disowning me because I'm leaving the pack and we're in an identity. Uh, and I have no idea why you're treating me well or if it is a scam. And do, what, what am I going to do? Wait another 30 years until someone else randomly comes in and pretend that I'm a nice person that whole time? And it's just way too confusing. And so what the, uh, what the uh, abuse identity does is uh, it seeks to re-coalesce into strength, which is integrity. Integrity is any time your, your values, your expectations, your beliefs, and your behaviors all line up in perfect synchrony. You've got very strong identity there, and it gives you a lot of certainty. Um, may not be any fun, may be a life of hell, but it is a it is a stable and a certain life of hell rather than a chaotic and terrifying, confusing life of some hell and some good, and I don't know what's going on. It's just too too terrifying. So the abuse survivor will start fighting the good treatment of someone who cares about them and enforcing the treatment of abuse. Um, and I've met, I've met several highly abused women in a dating environment. And within 30 minutes, they had managed to convince me that they were shits to the point that I wanted to hit them. And I was fascinated by this because like, I liked them or I wouldn't have gone on a date. I saw this good thing about them and I saw that good thing about them. And I thought, you know, this is great. And I would give them a compliment. I'd say, you know, thanks for being on time. That's what a great start of the date. I love that when people are on time. And so thanks for being on time and you look lovely. And they would respond by saying, um, well, I'm usually late and, uh, well, at least, or one, one thing went right. At least I'm not a complete failure or loser. And they said, you know, with absolute conviction that they were a complete failure and loser. And, and I'd say, I'd look at this and I'd think, what's wrong with this? There's nothing wrong with you. Um, I want to spend time with you. But they would knock every time I would uh, praise them. Every time I would appreciate them, they'd argue with me. And what they were arguing was, I'm really a shit, you just haven't seen it yet. And I didn't enjoy being argued with. But I also didn't enjoy my gifts being thrown back in my face. So that would be a downer. And this is happening. So that's happened like three times in the first 15 minutes. Three compliments, three arguments about how they really are shit and I shouldn't be complimenting them. Um, at some point, I would get irritated with all this, usually within 30 minutes. It's like, why are you arguing with me? You know, it's like this is becoming a boring, miserable date. Every time I say, try and reach out, you're, you're telling me that I'm wrong and that you know better and that you're, you really are a shit. I just am too dumb to know. Are you saying I'm dumb? You know, and I'd, I'd take this personally because, again, we're in a, in a psychologically illiterate culture and, and I, don't, you know, I don't fully know what's going on here. Um, now, when I express criticism at some point because this is an, an obnoxious pattern, Meaning if you're giving someone a gift and they say, oh, I don't deserve it and I'm, I'm just going to ruin it and all the, the, and all the, the, and they basically get more and more miserable the more nice things you do to them. You think, well, I don't want to make them miserable. How do I make them happy? Uh, well, I, th this is how I like to be treated. I like to be praised. I like to be appreciated. I like to have the things I work hard on noted. Um, I like to be seen in my positive side. I like this. So this is what I know to do. And it's true. It's like I'm not lying. I, I do appreciate you and this and this and this. So this is irritating. And I will confront the person at some point and say, you know, this isn't any fun arguing back and forth 
every time I want to share something with you. And then they would support the criticism. And they're often running on what a shit they are, basically. Saying, yes, I know I'm a terrible date, I'm this and that. And it's like, no, you're not a terrible date. But if you'll drop the argument every time I praise or give something, uh, then the date will actually be fun. That's the one thing that you're doing that isn't... I'm not complaining about your body. I'm not saying you're unlovable. I'm not saying you're too old. I'm not... None of that. This one habit. You're arguing with me when I give you a gift. And they would blow it up into a universal thing. Like, I'm just a terrible person. Would you like me to leave? And then I'm angry about that. Because I didn't say, you're a bad person. Would I like you to leave? I'm just bringing up because when any two people come together, you've got to negotiate a way that's good for both people. And it's not... I'm, I like complimenting people, but I'm not going to do it if I have to get into an argument every single time. So could you just stop that? Well, they wouldn't stop that, but they would then go on about, I, I know I'm a lousy person. You could probably do much better than me. Um, and at some point, they convince me. At some point, it's like, I can do much better than you. Not because there's anything wrong with you, but because this person, when I give them a compliment, they're going to smile and say, I'm glad you noticed that. I like being on time. And I say, great, me too. And now you've got a fun energy building. But you can't build that fun energy if someone's determined to, to, to blockade it. And so it is, of course, a lot easier to treat someone well who loves being treated well, who's grateful, who's celebratory of being treated well, and who knows they deserve it, and makes it easy for you to treat them well, and that will, if you treat them poorly, will say, man, that bit doesn't feel good there, but the, the rest is good, and will coach you. And I say, oh, thanks for telling me. I'm, I didn't know you had a, a sensitivity around that. And they say, yeah, don't, don't poke fun of that, or don't do this. And, don't. and then you navigate, and you win together. And it's based on the be belief that you're both valuable and you both have things to contribute. So, but, but this is why the abuse survivor in us, around the abuse identity, lashes out and makes it harder for people to love and care for us. Is because it's, it's, it's creating dissonance, leading us into the insanity of why were we and are we as such good and loving and beautiful people being treated so shittily by this person and this person and this person and this person in a power dynamic that feels scary to confront because we get more abused? Why are they doing all that? And what can I do about it? And how do I deal with the grief of that? It's just a lot to process. Um, and so... Uh, you know, that's typically what will, what will happen. You can even have someone be very angry at you. Go away. You're just like the rest of them. Da, da. And they're more angry when you treat them well as when you treat them poorly. Um, and my father was, was, had this trait around when you tried to love him. And I, I guess this would tie into, you know, unlovability. You know, if you tried to be close to him and nice to him, he would punish you. If you had nothing to do with him, he would talk well of you. And so I learned that as, you know, a, a teenager, and I had nothing to do with him after that. And as a result, he talked well of me. And I would hear from other people, your dad thinks highly of you. But that would own, you know, any, there were a few times where I tried to connect and this would just freak him out um, and he would start abusing me again. And so what, the, the natural response is to say, okay, um, I'll have nothing to do with you because I don't want to be abused. But then that leaves the disease encased in the culture. 
meaning there will be pockets of people like this uh, that are causing all kinds of damage to themselves and other people because they're living out a life consistent with I have no value, I'm unlovable, I'm an evil person, whatever it is. Um, and it's very difficult for a child who loves their parents and opens up you know, to that unconditionality to say, what do I need to be to be your son and this? And the answer is you have to be cynical, worthless, know that we're both d dirty and ugly and this and that and the other. And if you do that, you'll belong. I won't love you because we're unlovable, but at least you'll be like me. So that would make you happy if I'm like you? It's like, that's the only way to connect with you? It's, it's very, very terrifying and lonely for a child. Um, but... Uh, the, the next piece um, is, is an awareness that when abuse comes in and crystallizes into an identity of message and behavior and belief, now you have an internalization and the ability to infect other people with the same disease that you're now carrying. And you're carrying it by the collusion of the protector in the, in the psyche who identified the fact that the God, the big energy out there, will attack you for being healthy and you won't survive. Therefore, I'm going to shift my, my defense strategy before I protected your goodness by rebuffing abuse. But because that led to more abuse, now I'm going to protect your life physically by enabling the abuse that, that cooperates with an abusive power figure. Uh, that's how we're going to survive. It'll be a miserable life, but the body will stay alive. Now, when we abuse ourselves, when we abuse other people, uh, or when our abuser abuses us, it, it, what, what lands is the core beliefs and the message, which can be, I'm worthless, I'm unlovable. How that expresses itself is the key. Once that belief is, has taken root as a virus and been sustained in, in become strong insanity, meaning you now have a reality in which you don't feel loved and you don't perceive yourself being loved and you believe you're unlovable. That's a pretty strong reality. And you feel sane because they're all fitting together. Um, for example, if you believe that only, only bad people can make money and I'm good, and so, of course, I don't have any money, and yes, I don't have any money. And I, have, I know this good friend, and they don't have any money either. So you've got a nice triumvirate of everything's fitting nicely at that point. Um, as, as the belief expresses itself, it can take a variety of forms. Um, it can take the form of, I don't enjoy life. I have everything. It just doesn't mean anything. Money, fame, yeah, doesn't mean anything. I feel completely worthless and depressed and mi miserable because it doesn't matter. I'm still not a good person. I'm still not lovable. I'm still not valuable. My things are valuable, but I'm not valuable. But you can have the trappings, you know, the, the money, the, the, the whatever, and still feel like shit. And this is harder, this is a difficult thing to cure because everyone around you in a, in a materialistic culture says, gee, what great things you have and what great things you've done. But it doesn't matter because the belief is in there and the way it's showing up is I'm not going to enjoy life because that would be loving myself. I'm not going to own and really feel great because that would mean I feel valuable. So I'm going to just feel like a shit but do the things that are competent and lead to, to success. Uh, it can also, you know, take a variety of forms. You might be physically made to feel small and helpless and worthless by someone who beat you. And then you carry that worthlessness around. And the, the, re the, the reason this virus spreads, is, you know, and all beliefs spread, is that you have a, you have a, a, The ego is a microcosm of the culture. So there's one part of us 
that says if we are unlovable, then everyone else is unlovable too. If we acknowledge that we are essentially the same. Now, a lot of fragmentation goes on in, in advertising and media to convince you that, no, no, the person who wears Adidas, they're not a human being. They're, 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 they're beyond shame or whatever. And this creates the dating phenomena where we, you know, because we're not, if we think we're a shit, we're not attracted to ourselves because we're a shit. And if we discover the other person's humanness, then they're a shit too. Um, you know, I think George Burns said it best when he said, I'd never belong to a club that would have me as a member. So if it wouldn't have me as a member, that would be a worthy club to belong to. But if their standards are so low that they'd accept me, then I wouldn't belong to that club. Um, and so I want to belong to the clubs that don't want me as a member. And I've experienced this in dating as well, where I was, you know, an Adonis or, a, you know, some kind of a great something, as long as they knew that I would have nothing to do with them. <coughs> in other words, on a pedestal. But I said, I think it's great that you appreciate these and these and these qualities. I like hanging out with people who enjoy parts of me. So the fact that you like this about me, that's great because that's, that's what I do. That's who I am. So let's hang out. Then the response quickly goes, but, but me, what do I have? You know, I, I haven't graduated from college. I, I'm poor, I'm old and this and that and the other. And it's like, what does that have to do with enjoying each other's company? I enjoyed the, the I enjoyed the interaction. That's what relating is, an interaction. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, you know, what does that have to do with all this other stuff? And in a sense, what I'm saying is you can be valuable in an interaction regardless of your politics, your education, your financial and stuff, because we're human beings, because it feels good to create a good vibe together. That That's... And that's what I'm interested in. And we had a little moment of that. And I think it's possible we could have more. What? I thought you were someone special. I thought you'd never settle for someone like me. Well, what, what, you know, what's this someone like you? I'm saying, would you like to have dinner or whatever? And then again, By the time that I have somewhat, perhaps impatiently by this point, convinced them that they're not a complete loser, that they're just fine, that I'm not seeing them as anything less than me, they have convinced themselves that I wasn't as great as they thought I was when they were sure I'd have nothing to do with them, which is by, and then they start treating me poorly and then I don't have anything to do with them because I don't want to be treated poorly. And then they treat me well again. But if I keep treating with them and they treat me poorly, then they say, up, oh, he is accepting the poor treatment. I knew he was a shit just like me. So of course he's with me. We're both shits. So there's no way to win there either. And it's very difficult to, in, an, in a psychologically illiterate culture, you don't have this as a, as a conversation. What's your... What's your beliefs about this? Let's talk about the meta conversation. Um, and so that's, you know, a, 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 another frustrating way that the abuse identity and the low value identity manages to stay sane. Because that's what they're looking for is they're saying, you know, I'd rather convince myself that neat people were actually shitty if they have anything to do with me, then I'd like to open up and admit that I'm neat, but that there's a dissonance in my reality. There's a lot of people treating me like shit. I'm treating myself like shit, but I'm actually neat and I don't deserve to be treated like shit. But that's confusing. And so I'll just do this. 
and then of course the, the the you know the nice people do then withdraw because you're treating them like shit and then you become great again because you withdrew uh, and desirable because you withdrew but there's no way to be close because proximity is inconsistent with the beliefs and this again is is you know those beliefs were handed in very vulnerable states that deserve tremendous compassion and protection but then like that adult you know elephant that could easily break the rope but doesn't we're trapped in these beliefs of you know of feeling deeply unworthy um, and it's, uh, you know, I, I talk about other people because that's sometimes easier to see. But I do the exact same thing. We all behave consistent with what we think is reality, which is what we believe and perpetuate and to a certain extent gravitate, you know, from one to the other. And people generally fall into line. But it is incredibly vulnerable when you have been severely abused to go through that grief alone in a psychologically illiterate culture, understand one's value when no one around you does, recreate and start making choices that express that value, experience the hostility of the abuse cult around, around you for breaking the, your identity, go through the uncertainty, and have enough faith and trust in oneself to go through that to the point where you believe you're valuable and the whole world says you're valuable. That's, and, and this is why we honor heroes and heroines for making that transition from rags to riches from this, is they went through all that. Um, and it is available, it is available as a possibility to all of us if the beliefs will let in the possibility. There's no one in, you know, t for, most, for most of us in our grown-up life, this, the biggest prison is the belief and our clinging to the certainty that is afforded by the belief. Um, and, and, this, you know, and this takes great love and great courage to, to, to face and move through. Um, I also want to just kind of mention, you know, the need to belong equals the need to survive, which is the need to avoid trauma, um, which is to comply with the cult that is the dominant force, which is to follow the rules in the dominant force. And your cult is your family, your school, your religion, and your larger culture, and your media. These form your kind of a sense experience of the cults. And it's really wonderful to travel, by the way. This is one of the techniques that one can use to break an abuse culture. Um, I, looked out the, I looked for the most feminine place on, on earth, and I, I settled on Thailand. Um, and my reason for that was my femininity had been shamed and humiliated and bullied and attacked systematically uh, throughout the entire cult experience of being an American male. It was shamed by women, it was shamed by men, it was shamed by parents, it was shamed in school. Anything sensitive, anything emotional, anything uh, empathic was generally looked on as a little odd and the stuff that was kind of cult sanctioned, namely making money, being assertive, things like that were cele celebrated. And so I've gotten a fair amount of praise, but it is for masculine traits. And I've gotten a fair amount of shame, and it's for feminine traits. And of course, every human being that is healthy has a good balance of both masculine and feminine energy. If, you know, one may be in the lead, but you know, the, the, the grace comes from the synergy of the two. And so uh, it's very hard when one has internalized the humiliation and the shame to, to transcend all that. And so I went to Thailand. And in Thailand, what is celebrated in me is my femininity. Uh, and what I celebrate in them is their femininity, men and women, um, and culturally and all religiously. 
it's, it's a very, very beautiful experience. And surrounded by millions of people, there's this, it gives the courage to make the transition from the uncertain feeling of insanity that happens when your beliefs start to diverge. So whenever you're strongly updating your reality, your beliefs move first. You have to believe it's possible or you will not allow it. So you have to believe it's possible. Then you have to believe it's possible for you. Then you have to believe it's probable. And then based on that, you've got to take risks and go out and say, I'm going to behave like a valuable person even though I feel unvaluable. I'm going to behave like a lovable person even though I'm some part of me is convinced I can't be loved. And in behaving, now we open a doorway and some, peop some people love us. Some people value us. Now that strengthens the belief. Um, and then in that process, there's a certain moment in that when we, the, the, the traumatic events in childhood, the repressed, terrified memories we don't want to think about or whatever and can't face. Because at one point, a two-year-old little boy looked into the face of their abuser and said, I'm lovable. I'm lovable. And the abuser whacked them hard, physically, psychologically, sexually, etc. Whacked them hard and said, no, you're not. And the helplessness and the shame, etc. that was faced was too faint, painful to face. And so this is the, the stuck point of regression. I can't be in my body feeling that grief. I can't bear to be alone in the sorrow for that infant. I can't bear to think of what's going on with my neighbor's children. It's too much. And so I'm going to stay in my prison of belief and of blocking and dissociation. Well, as we make the pivot towards a life towards lovability, when there is hope that we could be fully lovable, that regressed child is going to show up and ask, are you now the first grown-up, the first adult in my entire life who actually can love me as I was? And as we look in their direction, one of two things will happen. We'll either get near the pain and say, I can't face that, I can't face that, and we will turn away from the child, the abused child, inside of us, and we'll say, I can't, it's not really real, I'm not really lovable. And we will start to collapse the lovability and stuff because we know that deep down inside, the deepest part of us, the strongest emotions, are aligned with this message I'm not lovable. Or we will have developed the emotional maturity and the psychological and trauma literacy to turn our eyes to that child and say, yes, you are lovable. I love you. That had nothing to do with you. That's not your fault. I'm sorry that you were hit. I'm sorry you were hated. I'm sorry your parents were afraid of your feelings. Never again. You're with me now, kid. And I love you. This is the moment of transcendence. This is the moment of becoming a new human being. A human being organized around value, around love, around compassion, around the higher functions of the brain and less around the reptilian brain. This is the point of transcending the wound. And in our culture, this pivot towards transcendence happens alone in most cultural situations. Meaning, it's very likely that a close friend in this culture will be an abuse survivor. Very few people are not. And as we open up into a new reality, the person who cannot face that pain, who cannot face that shame, 
who cannot love the innocence inside of them will say, I'm not worthy of this. This is not for me. I know I don't deserve this. And they will turn away from us to remain sane, to remain consistent with the abusive message and the abusive reality that that has created and the misery of their experience. And as I say, we have multiple dimensions to express abuse in. One is that we can express the abuse in just not enjoying life. I can have any amount of success I want in life as long as I don't enjoy it because someone who loved themselves would enjoy it and know they valued it and feel great and live a vital life. Mm, that's not me. This Chachka, anyone can create fame and fortune and stuff, and they can. Anyone can create fame and fortune and stuff. There's a system in our cult um, you know, that, that says, here's what you have to do to be famous, and, and you know, it's much easier for some than to others uh, because the culture has built-in stigmatism and stereotypes, but it's not that hard um, if that's all you want. But if the wound is not dealt with, that's done without any enjoyment or with addiction or with self-punishment. I create this success, but I'm a really bad person, so I'm going to have a terrible partner who's going to abuse me because I don't really deserve love. So, that's, that, so we can create the success, but know that it's kind of not very important and that we're really a shit and that we'll, we, we will find a way to be miserable in the success. That's one way we can... We can not address the wound and, and be successful. We can also um, uh, punish ourselves a lot on the outside, create illness, create stress, you know, create a whole variety of things, and wear our, wear our sanity, the fact that we are unlovable, so we have to be unloving towards ourselves, wear it in the behavior, so we can do that. We can do it mentally, you know, where... I'm on this great date, for example, and all I'm thinking is I'm a terrible person when she's going to find out, not enjoying the date, you know, so there's the abuse right there. And this is the, you know, this is the, you know, the, the I guess the sophistication of the psyche. And it's also the blind spot of our materialistic culture, because our materialistic culture is going to focus on You've got it if you've got the cult package. You've got the breast size, you've got the age range, you've got the degree, you've got whatever the cult says uh, you should have, and every cult defines that differently. In Africa, you've got it if you've got a huge plate in your mouth. So you, if you've got the huge plate in your mouth and in your materialistic culture, then you could say, look how handsome I am, I'm wearing a big plate, or I'm wearing this, or whatever it is. Every cult is different. But that's on the, on the surface. Uh, the, the, the deep work and the deep and most important terrain to, you know, to deal with is, is there any part of ourselves that was given the shame and abuse of our parents and made to feel unlovable that cannot come to the table of our psyche today and be welcomed with open arms? Because that six-year-old didn't deserve that. That 12-year-old didn't deserve that. And they feel unlovable because it was done to them. If we hate them rather than embrace them, they know they are still in shame. They know they are still unlovable. They're still carrying the virus. Now, we can dissociate, and there's a lot of shadow version. For example, many super-achieving parents, whatever, will have very dysfunctional children because they pass all the unlovability on to their child, just like they're doing with their inner child, and then they're disgusted. They don't want to be seen in public with their own children, and they're disgusted and tr constantly trying to hide that part of them that they've buried in their children uh, with their sophisticated business partners and all of that. We also, you know, do that dynamic. But the healthy freedom comes when, as we become adults, the initiation rite of becoming an adult is to face 
the most unloved parts of ourself and the beliefs that we formed in that moment as our abuser gave us the message, you are not valuable. If you were valuable, I wouldn't be raping you. I wouldn't be doing... Because, I mean, what kind of uh, crazy person thinks that highly valuable people uh, are raped as an expression of value? No, that, that doesn't make sense. Um, and so, I am being raped. I can't defend it. So I must not be valuable. And this is, this is really the the point of mastery, when those parts can come to the newly initiated adult and be loved unconditionally by the newly, addition, uh, newly initiated adult. Not a grown-up. You can die being in regress, in regress, pain, shame, and misery. An, an adult. Someone that has connected with the, the truth of their divinity, of their innate value that cannot be taken away because we are a part of an ecology that is amazing, that is incredible, that is becoming, that is growing. We are a part of that and it is valuable and we are a part of it and, and we are valuable. Um, and in that awareness we now have the initiation. We now are capable of reaching our full potential. That's the initiation of, of an adult, capable of reaching our full potential. When you believe you are worthless, you are only capable of reaching the potential that someone with that belief would hold. I'm worthless, so I'm capable of producing a reality in which I consistently feel worthless. I feel worthless, I think I'm worthless, I believe I'm worthless, I create realities. I get very nervous when my reality gets above worthlessness, like, oh my gosh, when's it going to collapse because I know I'm worthless and, oh my gosh, you know, how's it going to happen? And, uh, and so this, this is the moment. Um, and that moment is different, you know, for, for different people and comes at different people. But at that moment where we awaken to a possibility field that transcends the wound, the wound of the culture and the wound for us personally, the faces of the little ones, the faces of terror and loneliness that were given to us by our parents and teachers and cult, will come to us and say, what about me? Or they may hide and say, no, you may be worthwhile, but I'm not worthy. And then we must go to them, to each one, and say, hello, I know that I asked you to hide in the dark room and carry the unlovability of this world. I know that my parents asked you to be invisible because they hated that part in them and you embodied that. And I know that this person and this person told you to go away and never show yourself again because they couldn't deal with that part in themselves so they couldn't deal with you. And I know that we freaked out at that time and thought we would die unless we obeyed the power structure of the cult and so I let you go hiding there and left you carrying the shame of my parents, my abuser. But that is not your shame. That was my shame of not knowing what to do at the time and my protector's inability to protect you as a five-year-old, as a six-year-old. I'm sorry. That's not your fault. And giving back that shame to the abuser of the generations and the culture, etc., that, that went before. And I can love you. I love that beautiful, unique laugh that you have. I love your playfulness. I love your energy. I love your passion. And we're going to integrate that to create the possibility of who we are and who we are becoming. That's the test 
of the initiate, of the adult? Can they dig out the graves of those little ones who've been laid out row after row and welcome them home? And can they do that for another to look at the grief, to look at the suffering, to look at the pain, to look at the terror and the loneliness and the shame and say, I see you and this is not yours and I welcome you and I don't need you to carry my violence, my inadequacy, my terror. I don't need you to carry my craziness. Mom saying this is a, this is a, you know, this is a household of truth and justice and stuff, but I'm going to lie and pretend I didn't and then punish you for pointing it out. I don't need you to carry my insanity anymore. Let's give that back to mom. Uh, and I love you. Who do you want to become? What's your potential? This is, this is post-traumatic growth within the traumatic paradigm. It's mastery within you know, the human cultural uh, paradigm, and it is becoming an adult in a very human way in a world that as a system, the system is, uh, well, it's, it's intermittent in its creation of adults, but this is creating an adult and becoming an adult and part of that journey is awakening to the awareness of the transcendent energy outside of the cult in nature, the transcendent energy in, in, in spirit, in a sense, and, and here we get into our beliefs of what spirituality are, um, which I've always held to be bigger than any human can imagine, which means that if I can imagine a loving deity, then the deity is bigger than the love that I can imagine. But I will, of course, relate to the deity through what I can imagine and thus project in imagination. Um, this is, the, this is the, the path through to transcendence.